Would you please raise your hand if you have um, discovered the secret of happiness? No. Okay, one or two people did. <laughs> I have a list that I want to share with you this morning of 10 things that uh, supposedly will make you the most happy. I want to see if you agree with them. This list comes from columnist Amy Wong in Society 19 Online. She writes uh, an article titled 10 Simple Things Guaranteed to Bring You Happiness. Let's see if you agree. On the top of her list is hugs. Do hugs make you happy? Okay, that wasn't very overwhelming, but uh, that's okay. <laughs> Maybe you're not touchy-feely people, I guess. I don't know. Maybe that's part of it. Eating when you're hungry. Yes. Not eating when you're not hungry. You're not supposed to do that. Catching up on sleep. Or sleep in general. <laughs> Receiving packages in the mail. Yeah. Catching up with friends. Finding something you thought you lost. Walking in the park or wherever, maybe not the park, but somewhere you like to go walking. Uh, watching a movie or reading a book. I think you like one better than the other, but those are on the same, uh, on the same level, I guess. Exploring new places. How many of you like to travel? Yeah, some of you. And lastly, listening to your favorite songs also brings you happiness. Is there something that she missed, do you think? Do you have others? I'm curious, do you have others? Seeing your grandchildren grow up. Okay. Pets? Oh, pets, okay. Pets bring happiness too, yes? Okay. Mike, you have one? Church. Church makes you happy. That's good since you're here all the time. I'm glad it does. <laughs> There's a big one we're missing, and it's the whole point of today. It's the whole point of the Beatitudes, and I know you agree with all those things and more. There are other things, too, that make us happy, that guarantee, some people think, happiness. But they are things uh, we might strive to own or to have. Uh, the world tells us that material possessions or perhaps intangible things like peace or true love bring happiness as well. But in any case, happiness for many is centered around what we have. And so the more we have of it, the happier we are. Again, I think that's what the world tells us. Now, it's true some of these things may bring happiness, but it may not be lasting happiness, and the lists we come up with are certainly incomplete if we neglect to include what Jesus said about being happy. You know, he did say something about what it meant to be happy. Happiness is not a secret, but it may not be found where we expect it. And so we talk about the Beatitudes. Surely you have heard a sermon or two on these, so I'll try not to bore you today. But depending on the translation of the Bible being read, they begin by telling us that we are blessed or happy if we hold a certain attitude on life or we find ourselves in the situation that is mentioned. Um, in the New Living Translation, it says God blesses us or happy are those who, and it follows with a condition. Uh, the trick is finding out how the condition matches the blessing. And that's what I'd like to talk a little bit about this morning. You need to know that being blessed and being happy mean the same thing in both Greek and Latin, so the translation means the same thing. You can use those two terms interchangeably. We could spend a great deal of time talking about each of these Beatitudes, or we could do a sermon series on them, neither of which I'm going to do. Uh, I would like to focus on just one of these today, the first Beatitude. And as it reads in the New Living Translation, as Betsy just read it, it goes, 
God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. I think this beatitude is the grounding point for all of the others. If we understand this first beatitude, there's a good chance we'll understand the rest. However, that can be challenging. Billy Graham said this about the beatitude. Many people have asked, how can being poor in spirit be a blessing? No one is more pathetic than the person who is in great need and is not aware of it. Why is poor in spirit something God wants us to be? Why would God want us to be poor at anything or in anything? Some propose that Jesus was speaking about financial poverty in this first beatitude, that he's advocating being poor so that riches and possessions don't come between us and God. And certainly that's true. Uh, we can hear many places in the Bible where Jesus teaches uh, that uh, we should be warned about seeking riches so that it does not uh, come between us and God. But that does not seem to be Jesus' point in uh, what he says as he begins the Sermon on the Mount. In the Beatitudes, Jesus is concerned with spiritual realities, not material possessions. So what then does it mean to be spiritually poor? To be poor in spirit means to be aware that we are fully dependent on God. True happiness is found when we understand who we really are outside of the grace of God, and because of that, we choose to embrace him. There's an emptiness inside each of us, at one point or another, that no one nor anything else could fill and can fill but God. And most of us here today have probably recognized this truth. However, some of us need to be reminded of it. We are nothing without God. We said that in our opening prayer. To agree with that means to understand our own spiritual poverty. Blessed is the one who is poor in spirit, recognizing their need for him. The great 19th century preacher Charles Spurgeon said, The first link between my soul and Christ is not my riches, but my need. Only God can satisfy our soul's emptiness, its deepest longings, desires, and appetites. But not everyone recognizes that truth or turns to God. Our greatest need is a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, but many have tried to fill that need with someone or something else. You may recall a time in your life when you have done that, and you probably know others, even today, who are trying to fill that need in other ways to include searching for happiness that does not include God. Even when we have made the decision to invite Christ into our lives, the world continues to inundate us with messages stating that need can be met somewhere else. Often we need a reminder that the only real lasting answer to our soul's most critical situation is none other than Jesus. So, today, we need to take a few moments to recognize again that our souls need as much attention as our bodies. We need fellowship, first with God and then with one another. We have a need to worship and engage in spiritual practice such as prayer. We need quiet from time to time. We need Bible study. We need the opportunity to reflect on Scripture. We need to be encouraged and supported in our walk. Without these things, without our souls being fed and exercised, we begin to spiritually dry up and become weak. So it is the wise person who understands who they really are without God, and then opens him or herself up to the full joy of knowing who they are in Christ. 
So I'm hoping this gets us closer to an understanding of what Jesus meant in the Beatitudes by being poor in spirit, yet being happy and blessed at the same moment. So it makes sense for us then to realize our own situation as we sit here this morning. Spiritual emptiness comes before filling and spiritual poverty before blessing. We cannot be completely filled until we realize that we are empty. We cannot be made worthy until we recognize our unworthiness. We cannot live until we admit we are dead. Happiness, Jesus said, comes from admitting that we are lacking and then asking him to come into our lives. And God stands ready and able to show that mercy. This happened before in our lives, but is available to experience again and again. True happiness is found when we remember who we really are without him and how blessed we are with him. In other words, happy are those who are humble, and those are the words of the third beatitude that Betsy read for us. But the first step to true happiness is to be humble. Jesus puts this beatitude first because humility is the foundation of all the others and is a basic element in becoming a Christian. Again, blessed are they that surrender and submit to God's authority. Only then will the kingdom of heaven be theirs. Only then can one receive the gift of salvation. We cannot begin our Christian lives without humility. And we cannot live the Christian faith well without constant surrender. Maybe that's the reminder we need to receive this morning. Being humble admits we don't have it all together. Anybody there? Realizing we haven't arrived yet, realizing we haven't yet learned it all, and that we are not the center of the universe. Happy are the humble. If we want to have lasting happiness, then we need to learn to be humble before God. Many of you have a favorite verse in scripture, and probably quite a few of you uh, take this scripture from Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. You've heard this. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You've heard people uh, use that as a phrase uh, to share where they are in their lives. But what that means is that in humility, when one uses this scripture to help them through the difficult situations of life, they are essentially saying that they choose to give up getting through the rough places of life on their own, and they are relying on Jesus to pull them through. This is an example of being poor in spirit. When is the last time you thought about relying on Christ to get you through a tough situation? Maybe you have, and that's a good thing. But maybe that is also something you'll remember the next time you're in a tough place. And perhaps you might see in that moment how blessed you can be as you humble yourself before the Lord. I think there is a real promise in this beatitude. Not that the other beatitudes don't have a promise of blessing and happiness, but there's more to it than a simple yet profound statement that relying on God results in receiving the kingdom of heaven. I want to read this particular beatitude from the message paraphrase. Uh, Eugene Peterson puts it this way. You're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With less of you, there is more of God and his rule. Now, I think most of us would think that is not a good place to be at the end of our rope. To find ourselves in situations where everything has fallen apart and the pieces are difficult to put back together. But Jesus says you are blessed when you reach that point. Because you're finally looking 
in the right direction. You finally made room for God to move in your life. You know, you've heard it said that people need to hit rock bottom before uh, they begin to get better, especially in addictions and that sort of thing. Maybe this is uh, kind of like that. But making room for God in your life is something we all need to do, and we've, we've done this. This has happened before in our lives when we've turned to him for salvation, but it also happens in the daily trials of life. It happens all of the time, or ought to. Eventually, we even learn to trust him more in the not-so-difficult times, too. So it's not a lesson we learn only once. It's a comfort to know that when things really are not looking good, if we will humble ourselves and realize our need, there is more room for God. There's less of us to get in the way, and there's more room for God to act. And that's difficult for some of us, I know, because we may believe the saying that the Lord helps those who help themselves. Have you heard people say that before? Have you heard people uh, try to say that it belongs in the Bible? That the Lord helps those who help themselves? We try to take things into our own hands, and unfortunately, the results are usually less than favorable. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that. But according to a Barna survey, 81% of Christians thought it was. 81% of Christians thought that phrase was in the Bible. But we hear today in the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount that in contrast, God helps those who can't help themselves. God helps those who ask for help. They humble themselves, considering themselves poor in spirit. The ones who are poor in spirit are the ones who receive the blessing. Consider the number of uh, people and stories we remember in the Bible who have come to Jesus in just this way. Just a few of them as a reminder. A woman who had been bleeding for 12 years, a synagogue ruler whose daughter dies, a centurion whose servant is sick, a blind beggar who calls out to Jesus to be healed, and 12 men in a boat in a storm, fearing for their lives. In each of these cases, we find them turning to the right person, to the right place to be saved, to be healed, to become whole. And the list doesn't end with them. There are certainly many more in the Bible, and we can add ourselves to that too. All of these, all of us, hopefully, realize who they are and how desperate are their situations without Jesus in their lives. They are at the end of their rope, but they realize how dependent they are on the one who can save them, and the result is that they are blessed. God blesses those who know who they really are without God, broken, vulnerable, and damaged, the poor in spirit. But happy are they because they realize where their help comes from. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven, and with God they are made whole. So they happen at the very same moment when we understand our utter dependence on God, we understand how blessed we can be. It's very likely that many of you have acknowledged your spiritual poverty. You wouldn't be sitting in church otherwise. Maybe you've trusted in God for your salvation already. I'm sure many of you have. Yet I am also sure that there are some here today, maybe even some of the same people, who are in a place of struggle or concern, which has you upset or unsettled about something. This beatitude is your reminder that as much as you choose to turn to Christ, you are invited to do so again today. As
as much as you received him previously, Christ makes himself available again to us today. You are invited to renew your dependence on God, to make space for him again, and yes, be happy and be blessed. God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs.